Welcome back to another Sports Next Door podcast. My name is Owen, and I am joined, as I always am, by my virtual neighbor, Max, on this Sunday night. It's been a while since we've done one of these, uh, but I'm busy tomorrow morning, so we're getting our content out a little bit earlier than normal. Yes, we are. It's uh, I, You had a card game that ran a little later than expected, which might have been for the best because I had just finished my Sunday family night dinner. And uh, with roast beef, you got to have some of that red wine. And, you know, Sunday night dinner also got pushed a bit back. So while waiting, a little more got poured than normal. So I had a nice buzz. That's a little toned down and that might be for the best. How are you doing? Nice. Good. Car game went well. I absolutely crushed everyone. So uh, always nice that when you can uh, stimulate the competitive fuel within you and, and it turns out successful. And I got to catch bits and pieces of the Raptors game while it was going on. And now that that's done, we could talk about it a little bit more because uh, it's fresh in my mind. But before we get there, uh, I'll just run down what we're going to talk about today, or tonight that is. And uh, it, we're going to start off with a little bit of discussion and just, it's been over 10 months now. Uh, we've been in this COVID age for quite some time and we just got some, some things to break down and analyze about it that, that have probably been said before, but just consolidate our feelings about it uh, to kick the show off. I'll talk a little bit of baseball news, a little bit of football news, including a Super Bowl preview and the recent blockbuster trade that happened. Uh, and we'll finish off with some NBA storylines and some hockey talk. Uh, so it's going to be a, a nice packed show here on this Sunday night. But without further ado, Max, why don't you kick us off talking about everything you hate about COVID-19 and sports? Yeah, this this segment has been building for quite a while now. And really, there's two pet peeves for me about the actual in the game, watching games, which we've been doing now for, I guess, not the full 10 months, but ever since the NHL and NBA came back sometime August, I guess. There have been two things really on my mind that just constantly bother me. I guess uh, one thing the whole time. So I'll start it off saying the fan noises. I cannot, I don't understand why they have to put in the fake fan noises that I don't get any value out of it. Every time I hear them it in hockey, whether it's on like a goalie robbing a player whether it's after a goal the end of a game they just seem to put those in with basketball it bothers me even more because they throw them more like when someone's taking foul shots uh, I was catching a Denver Nuggets Utah Jazz game a couple weeks ago and when players were shooting air balls they were throwing in fans faking the air ball chance I don't understand what value it adds it seems so unnecessary to me so superfluous and i i hate it and i think the hatred of that is really what spawned me wanting to do this segment yeah i in terms of fan noises i completely agree uh the bubble was a surreal experience for the nba and the nhl and having that kind of background crowd hum i don't mind actually the baseline noise level uh just to kind of give you that sense of familiarity with the game but I do really love listening to the players chatter and the stuff that gets said obviously they can't they might have to run it a couple like on a bit of a tape delay and maybe bleep out anything for kids who would be watching but I love hearing the communication go that goes on and a little bit of the trash talk like when the Clippers and Lakers were playing it'd be the guys on the bench just yapping their mouths off the whole time to players on the court. And when someone makes a big shot, they turn to the bench and say something. I loved all that little interplay. It was fantastic. But I think the sport where it's the most important, uh, basketball, hockey, baseball, whatever, but football seems to be the one where you kind of have to have fan noise because it's such an important factor in deciding games. NFL home field advantage is probably the most pronounced in any of the sports because they only play once a week and because the stadiums are so much bigger uh, and noisier and, and they're designed to in, like enhance sound. And so 
they need that fan noise to be at a certain level just so that when the opposing team is on offense, it disrupts them somewhat because you want to recreate that kind of home field advantage of the, of the loudness of the crowd. It doesn't necessarily have to be loud on your TV and those like superfluous noises that you talk about. But I think for football, it's necessary to have a certain level. I think they capped it at 70 decibels uh, just in order to recreate that advantage that teams have from playing at home. You know, I remember I was catching the one of the first playoffs NFL games and they were listing off an interview they'd done with Josh Allen, I think. It was the Bills game. I can't remember if it was Josh Allen or the opposing quarterback, but he was talking about that and he was saying like, no, I, I, it's so strange to be playing these games and I'm not shouting at the top of my lungs to like run an audible or make the adjustments on the line of scrimmage. So... I guess, first of all, I don't think that effect has been achieved. And then second of all, like one of the beautiful, one of the, I guess, silver linings of COVID has been like some of the things they've tried that I quite like in sports, like within, in the NBA, I love, we've talked about this, the nine and 10 uh, seeds for the playoffs that they're doing i love the canadian division in the nhl which we're gonna get into later i've loved hearing the ufc like every punch every kick you hear so much crisper the corner instructions you hear so much like i my opinion is in this different environment just run with it see what happens i mean I want to know how significant home field advantage is in football. Like, does it make as much of a difference as we think? Here's our opportunity to find out. Does having the uh, fans boo and do as much as they can to disrupt foul shots in the NBA make a difference? Let's find out. Like, we don't have to stick to this old system and recreate it just for the sake of recreating it. Like, we know we'll get back there one day, so why not? see do the run the scientific method like let's remove a variable and see if there's any differences i mean maybe it's not exactly scientific because you've got more than one variable but i i don't buy into that yeah it's a great point and uh i think this year the nfl had the best road record they've ever seen like the most road teams won and uh covered the spread that they've ever seen in their history which makes sense and I think it really does show the importance of home field advantage in the NFL. Uh, yeah, I, and I, yeah, I agree. It's it's definitely a different environment and you can never recreate having fans. Like imagine that Kawhi shot happening in a bubble. It's just not the same. It's not the same. Those moments are made because of the fan reaction that happens. The explosion of Scotiabank Arena or oracle arena when the warriors were at their peak or that ray allen shot right those are like those are basketball examples but the fans add so much to that experience and they can't be recreated by sounds played over a speaker and so leverage what people are loving about the lack of fans and i think yeah that that would be a qualm that we have that we'd want to see done is there anything else you want to talk about absolutely why they do extreme, extreme levels of testing. Players are tested almost every day. When like the player's cousin's brother's girlfriend ran on the street, tests positive for COVID, the whole team isn't allowed to play that night. They are on top of testing as much as they can be. Why the hell do coaches have to wear masks? It The players on the court don't have to wear masks. The refs, like putting making the coaches wear masks in the nba and in the nhl is really just an excuse for the refs to go oh what's that i can't hear you and then when the coaches pull their mask down pull your mask back up that's all it is like an excuse for the ref it seems i i thought i we have our show notes here i thought i had coaches wearing masks i don't know if you adjusted that to half wearing masks yeah i did because I agree. Like the, what I see is I see coaches in the NFL everywhere. It's, it's either they're fully wearing it or it's covering their mouth or it's sitting on their chin or they've got a hang from an ear. Like it's there, but it, they're not wearing it because no. why would they, if they're being tested every day and all the things that are happening, they, they have them all, 
like, I understand the science of it and it reduces the risk, but it reduces the risk so minimally when you have guys running, like high-fiving them as they come off to the bench and sweating all over each other when they're playing in the game. And it's just, there's way too many things happening in a sporting environment where them like having the mask over their mouth or wherever they have it, it's just, it might as, you might as well just not wear it. Yeah, the risk it's reducing is that in between whenever the coach got tested, like that day or the day before, that test being like, say, a false negative or them catching COVID in between the test showing negative and them showing up to the arena, them somehow not spreading it to the players like before, which is unlikely. And then, yeah, it's not, there's... I can't really imagine a scenario where the mask, where the coach has COVID somehow not picked up by the tests and uh, the mask saves the players from getting it. And yeah, anytime the coach wants to actually speak to the team, they have to pull the mask down anyway. It's silly. And I don't know if you have anything more to say on that or I should just transition to the next one. Let's move it along. What else you got for me? Yeah, last one. This one is NHL specific, and you can kind of springboard your fourth point off it. But speaking of testing or protocols that don't make any sense around the tests, um, we have to talk about that Alexander Ovechkin suspension and the fine that got hit on the Washington Capitals. If you are a fan of other sports other than hockey and you're not familiar with this story, essentially the Washington Capitals, while on a road trip, um, there are four Russian-born players. I can't remember all their names off the top of my head, but Ovechkin, the captain, and Kuznetsov. I don't know if you remember the other two. I um, Backstrom, maybe. And, no, yeah. they were all Russian. No. Yeah, I, so I don't doubt it. But... They, at a hotel room, like on the road, went and hung out in one player's room, and they all had to be suspended, weren't allowed to play, and the Washington Capitals had to take a big fine for it. The, the idea behind that being that maybe, just maybe, one of those players, like, caught covid while on the road or like in between games in between practices and like yeah it's fine to have these players on the bench together yeah it's fine to have these players in the dressing room together yeah it's fine to have these players at practice together but no it's not fine for them to like off the ice hang out together i i hate it like it's so draconian and it's the chance just like the coach thing in my opinion the chance of having a covid spread from something like that is so minimal that this just seems like cruel and unnecessary punishment to me yeah and and that's where i'll springboard right into my point is it's such an important thing to talk about is that how covid has affected everyone and their mental health it's something that i had i have to do a presentation on this week and it's something that is definitely affecting these players. And although those back home can say that these are millionaires who are paid to play the sport that they love and we're all doing it, why do they complain? But they do it because they have a platform where people can hear them and that's why they share it. And second of all, you can stay at home with your family and loved ones or maybe you have people that you go and see like outside for a walk, whatever you do. These players are stuck in a hotel room by themselves for 24, 48 hours, 72 hours while they wait for their next game and they can't leave that room, that little box. So what I'm saying, so what I would say is, is the NBA wants to, or who, NBA, NHL, MLB, whatever, they want to discourage their players from going out into the cities and putting themselves at risk, then allow them to spend time with their teammates in the hotel outside of, so that way they can hang out with their teammates and that disincentivizes them from trying to sneak out and go other places because you're lowering that risk. They're, they're all around each other anyways. So if that's where they're staying and only interacting with those same teammates in a hotel environment, then it's going to have much lower risk and it just makes more sense. They have to figure out ways to keep these players entertained and content because otherwise it's going to have a very significant impact on their performance which is going to hurt the product of the leagues so that's just the last thing that i wanted to say 
Um, there's a lot of things that we hate about this and that everyone hates about this that we've litigated on and off for over 10 months now. But it was something that had to be said uh, and discussed because, yeah, some of these things are just silly. And, and the biggest thing we're looking for is consistency, right? It's a very fluid situation. But if you're going to have a policy, then you have to stick to it. Otherwise, it's... Yeah, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, I mean, what I'm looking for is thoughtful and meaningful policy. And this, the coach is wearing masks on the court, on the ice, and this ban to the Capitals players or suspension to the Capitals players who like probably either like eight hours before or 12 hours later, we're about to be in the same dressing room and like sharing a practice ice together anyway what they both have in common is just trying to look good and posture like, yes, we're taking COVID very seriously. Well, I guess the coach in one isn't harmful to mental health. It's just harmful to the coach's vocal cords. But as you said very well, this forcing players into a hotel room for like hours on end with not being allowed any human contact when there's their like fellow countrymen in the Russians case, like I don't, Ovechkin has pretty good English these days, but not all of the players do. And some of the newer ones are fresh from Russia, like three, four years later. And the NHL is a very diverse league. This is going to be true of the Swedes, of the Danes, of German players. Just there's no reason for it. And it's harmful to their mental health. Like it's not consistency almost doesn't seem like the right word for me because like you said, it is fluid and what we know about COVID is changing, but let's make policy based on what we know about COVID and structured around testing and structured around preventing COVID, not around looking good about COVID. Very well said. Uh, that is all for this uh, topic. We wanted to have it said. We're going to take a quick break and then get into the sports. <laughs> and we're back. I'm going to just talk about the recent trade in baseball. Uh, I'm normally not going to cover a ton of baseball news, but this is a player that I'd love to watch for the last couple of years, and I think it's a big move in the National League. Colorado Rockies third baseman Nolan Arenado traded to the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, he's a career 290 hitter who's good for about 35 home runs and 114 RBIs while being a gold glove defenseman. He's an absolute stud all over the diamond. Uh, he's just a fantastic player. And I think he's gone really overlooked in a smaller market uh, in Colorado. The one knock against him is that playing in Colorado, your, your numbers can be a little bit skewed because of the altitude and the ball carries more. And so it is more of a hitter friendly place to play. And Arenado's numbers are not nearly as good on the road than they are at home. So that's the argument you can make against them. However, the defense will translate and the average translates, right? It's not like he's hitting 250 and pumping out all these home runs. He still hits for a very good average. And he's a player veteran who's been like stuck on this Colorado team that's been mediocre for quite a few years now. And he goes to a St. Louis team that just does everything the right way. And he joins a absolutely gold glove filled infield. Uh, and he's just going to be fantastic. And I'm really excited to watch him play. So that's quickly just baseball news. Uh, I'm going to move right into football fan cave uh, leading off with the other big piece of uh, trade information that happened this weekend. The Detroit Lions have finally moved on from number one pick Matthew Stafford, trading him to the Los Angeles Rams for number one pick Jared Goff, two first round picks and a third round pick. So they swap quarterbacks and the Lions get extra assets, which is fantastic for them because they are ready to start their rebuild and move on into a different direction. They just got a new coach. Uh, I they're going to have golf for a while, which is a, a lot of money, but they can focus on building up the rest of their team. So then when that golf contract is done, they can go out and get a really solid quarterback to, to finish up the pieces that they'll build in the meantime. On the side of the Los Angeles Rams, I guess they hate first round picks because they now will not draft in the first round for seven straight years. Uh, they've 
given them all away to acquire really top end talent. And they believe that Matthew Stafford is going to be the final piece to put them over the hump. They reached the Super Bowl two years ago, and now they've pretty much got two years to reach it before this team, that lack of draft talent catches up to them. Uh, they've got guys ready to win right now, and it's respectable to trade for proven talent in, uh, for, in exchange for guys that just might not pan out. But when you've got Aaron Donald and Jalen Ramsey and all these offensive weapons, three-headed running backs that are all solid, uh, led by Cam Akers, who had a great rookie season. And now you've got Matthew Stafford, who some say is the most underrated quarterback of his era and is a guy who should be a Hall of Famer, but plays on a team, on a Detroit team that like is maybe the most tortured fo football uh, fan base. So I'm really excited to see what happens. I hope Stafford's healthy because he is an absolute – tough dude he fights through injuries he plays through everything so I'm hoping he's fully healthy and he's able to utilize this fantastic Sean McVay offense with lots of motion lots of running the defense for the Rams is going to be great again next year when you have those two cornerstone pieces uh, it's a win now move and the Rams now move up to second the most likely team in the NFC to make the Super Bowl uh, behind the Packers next year and they're tied with the Bucks. Uh, so they're raising their title chances. This is it for Stafford. If he doesn't perform well here, then it will have a big effect on how people perceive him because he's always been the guy that everyone loves, but he's been on a bad team. So he's been allowed to put up big numbers and people respect him for it. But now if he's on a team that's supposed to win, he has to prove himself. He has to put up those same numbers in order to prove that he is a top tier guy. So it'll be really, really fun to watch this team next year. And I'm looking forward to it. And for the Lions, they're starting to do things the right way. Fans know they've been through rebuilds many a time, uh, but hopefully this one works out for them. And, and looking forward to see what happens next year. But before we get to next year, next weekend, we have the big game, the Super Bowl. Uh, I'm going to preview most of the game stuff this week and then, or I guess today on this podcast, and then I will talk a little bit more gambling uh, as we get to Friday, just because I'm sure everyone will have heard every single storyline there is to hear by that point, and we'll want to hear something a little bit different from the matchups and the star names. So the first thing I'll lead off with, probably already heard it, but hey, Max, did you know that this is the first ever home Super Bowl for a team? Yes, it had to happen eventually. Yeah, so the Tampa Bay Buccaneers will be playing in their home field uh, hosting the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, it's the first time that this has ever happened, and it's what a year to happen. I know, I can't believe it. Uh, they're gonna get, I think, seventy five hundred vaccinated healthcare workers in there to cheer them on. So decent atmosphere, hopefully. That's a nice uh, story. Yeah, it is. It is good, but it's definitely a PR stunt on the NFL's part. I don't really give them credit for anything <laughs> when it comes to the NFL, uh, but yeah. Cool little side bit. Maybe this gives Tampa Bay an advantage. Who knows? But it's tough to – you're going to need every advantage you need in the margins when you're going up against a juggernaut like the Kansas City Chiefs. The next storyline I want to talk about is, of course, what all the casual fans will know about this game, and that is Tom Brady and Patrick mm -hmm. Holmes, right? The goat and the baby goat. <laughs> I don't even know. What do they call baby goats? Baby goats. Calves? No. Nope. Foals? No, the horse isn't. Uh, whatever. Baby goat. Uh, that's what we're calling them. And uh, they have a two and two all time record against each other, with Brady having the more signature win uh, when the Patriots went into Arrowhead Stadium and won the AFC Championship game in overtime against the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, Brady is set to play in his 10th Super Bowl. Uh, he's played in 18% of all Super Bowls in history. It's just absolutely astounding numbers from him. And it's something that will maybe never been be achieved. But the person who could achieve it is Patrick Mahomes. Because the kid. Mahomes, yeah. That's what they call okay. the baby goat, a kid. Nice. I like it. So the goat versus the kid. And Mahomes, if he wins this, he's got two Super Bowls and one NFL MVP after three seasons which is about, believe it or not, that's about the same pace as Tom Brady, which is hard to fathom to just step in and be so elite right away. But 
when you're Tom Brady, you got to average a Super Bowl every three to four years. And and Mahomes, I think, is the only one who has ever who's going to have a shot at it because of just how immensely talented and like phenomenal this kid is. He's an alien, and it's just so fun to watch him, even if he's on a division rival for my Denver Broncos. Luckily, our team is not great, so we don't have to go up against them in the playoffs. I don't mind being in rebuild mode when they're on the ascension. <laughs> But just, yeah, this, these are the two that people are going to watch. Uh, Mahomes is probably going to live up to it. I, I worry about Tom. I think people put him very high, but he hasn't really had a fantastic performance yet in a playoff game. He had a great first half against the Packers and then through three interceptions, he was not great against New Orleans and he didn't have to be great against Washington. So just waiting for that signature Tom Brady performance, who knows, maybe this will be it. Also on the note of Tom Brady, we have to bring up the Brady versus Belichick power rankings because those two forever had been associated with their success together. And it was always, is Brady a system quarterback or is Belichick only successful because he's had this once in a lifetime quarterback? Now people will like to say that Tom Brady, even though despite he's old, he's still winning with this team. And Belichick had a seven and nine record with his team. So people are starting to put Brady above Bill in terms of the uh, all time legacy score, if you will. So it's just an interesting little thing to follow. Uh, I will give Belichick a bit of a break because the Patriots had the most opt outs out of any team going into this 2020 season. Uh, just brutal quarterback in Cam Newton and Jared Stidham gave him nothing. And uh, on the other side, Tom Brady's got all the weapons he could ever need on offense and a really, really solid defense to back it up. Just overall, the team is better for Tampa Bay. And so, and in a weaker conference. So it is, you would give Brady the edge just because he's reached the Super Bowl now without Bill. But I think Belichick does have some caveats that you have to uh, consider when ranking these two against each other. Let's move on to the actual game, shall we? Uh, I no, everyone's looking forward to seeing an absolute slugfest from the offenses, and I don't see why that won't happen. You've got Patrick Mahomes with Travis Kelsey, who this season had the most receiving yards by a tight end in NFL history. That kind of went under the radar, but he is basically unstoppable in space. Uh, he's not as physical as some of the great tight ends who block and, and just mold people over like a Gronk but he is probably the most athletic in space and getting open on routes for someone his size. And he does it so well. You've got Tyree Kill, who, when he's in open space, it seems like he's untackleable, as we saw in the championship game uh, against the Packers, where he just caught a crossing route over the middle and then took it an extra 40 yards downfield and made people look like they were running in slow motion. He's just so fast. And he burned Carlton Davis twice the last time these two teams played in the regular season just made him look like he wasn't even there. You've got McCole Hardman, Clyde Edwards, Lair, Sammy Watkins, uh, Byron Pringle is like their fifth wide receiver and he is an absolute speed demon. Uh, and you've got uh, Robinson as well. Like they've just got so much speed and so many different weapons that all fit so nicely around Hill, Kelsey and Mahomes that, Kansas City, like I said, they can put 21 on you in like six minutes if they get the right defensive stops. So this offense is going to roll. It's just going to be uh, if Tampa Bay can keep up. And I think they can. When you've got Tom Brady, who most of the time doesn't turn the ball over, uh, Leonard Fournette, playoff Lenny, has been fantastic stepping up for the Bucks and and just providing that extra running pizzazz because – for so long, he had been stuck getting a ton of carries for Jacksonville. So he's a little bit fresher now because he's gotten less carries this season. So he's used to a heavier workload. So he might be uh, a little bit healthier and a little bit stronger at this point in the season. Uh, and that's what they need. He was picked fourth overall way back. He does have the talent in there some somewhere to have a great game. But if not, Ronald Jones has been excellent as well this year for the Buccaneers in the backfield. They've also got Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Scotty Miller, Antonio Brown, Rob Gronkowski, Cameron Brait, like weapons all over the place. And then this kid, Tyler Johnson, I swear he's had two catches in the playoffs and they've been the two biggest catches by a Bucks receiver in the playoffs. Just like huge first down conversions, 
um, great plays by him. And, and he is like the eighth guy that Brady's looking at. So just a battle of absolute arsenals going up against each other. Weapons galore. It should be really, really exciting to watch these two go at it. But I do want to talk about the defenses because these defenses are not necessarily the top tier defenses, but they're defenses that are perfectly aligned with great offenses because they make plays when it matters. You don't always have to stop a team every time they have the ball. It's as long as you can bend and not break and then have your one or two opportunistic moments where you peanut punch a football or you make an interception off of a tip. And that's what these defenses do so well. Tyron Matthew and Chris Jones are absolute playmakers for the Chiefs, whether it's rushing the quarterback or Matthew is so great at studying film and coming up with one big interception that can make all the difference when the Chiefs offense will score basically every possession. This Chiefs defense now third straight AFC championship appearance and second straight Super Bowl appearance. They've seen it all. They're vets. They know what it takes. Uh, they've been here before, and I'm looking for them to make some big plays in this game. Uh, I don't think they're going to be excellent and hold the Tampa Bay offense under 20, but they're going to come up with the plays that they need to make, and it's whether Kansas City is going to be able to convert on those chances. On the other side, Tom Brady has – a defense that he hasn't had since oh, the Patriots won that Super Bowl against the Los Angeles Rams. This defense for Tampa Bay has a young, confident secondary who's not scared of anyone. They went in to Green Bay and said, Devontae, we're going to shut you down. Lazar, we're going to shut you down. Aaron Rodgers, we don't care who you are. We're up in your grill. We're pressing at the line. And they might get burned a couple times, but they're going to come right back and do it again. And their, their secondary has stepped up in a big way. They're not scared of anyone and they've been playing really well and they complement the linebackers so well because these linebackers are probably the fastest in the NFL. Devante, uh, Levante David, pardon me, and Devin White uh, have shown out they've been absolute studs. They all over the field tackling running backs in the backfield or deflecting passes or just getting to those speedy guys across the middle. I worry about them being fast, but not Tyreek Hill fast, not Nicole Hardman fast. So it it will be interesting to see how they're used and if they're more blitzing or if they're going to sit back in coverage. Because I think if they sit back in coverage, they're not going to be as effective. They're really, really going to be need to be super duper stars in order to disrupt this Kansas City offense. Mahomes is fantastic against the blitz. Teams have been able to slow down the Kansas, not stop it, slow down the Kansas City offense by sitting in a lot of coverage. But Todd Bowles has brought out some great schemes so far in the playoffs. So we'll see what he does to try and get to Mahomes and, and make him rush and get rid of the ball quickly. Uh, yeah, it's, it's whichever defense can stop the run uh, and make one or two big plays is going to be the difference in this game. And that kind of completes my preview of the game itself for the Super Bowl. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the props I'm looking at as we get to Friday. Uh, but yeah, really excited for the Super Bowl coming up next weekend. Uh, and that's it for me. We're going to take a quick break and come back and do some sports that are a little bit closer to home up here north of the border. And we're back for our NBA storylines. And boy, have we got... Uh some storylines for tonight let's start off with the most imminent you just watched this highlight the washington wizards have added what their third fourth win on the season over the brooklyn nets on the back of two threes in the last 10 seconds walk me through it yeah we had some crazy finishes to games this weekend and just right now kind of as we were recording a little bit before Bradley Beal walks the ball up with 10 seconds, splashes a three right in the face of the defender. On the inbounds, the Brooklyn Nets, miscommunication, cuts the wrong way, throws it right to a Washington Wizards player, dishes it out to Russell Westbrook, who has been having a terrible season efficiency-wise and definitely looks injured, hits the game-winning three and had 40 points tonight. Uh, wow. Wow. Hopefully it's the start of the redemption story for Westbrook because his stock has fallen immensely recently. And wow, the Wizards pull it out. They're down five. They needed two threes and they got two threes and they pull out a win against the Brooklyn Nets who got to be shaking their heads because that's one that they needed. 
Yeah, I mean, as as we went in to start recording this podcast just before you were checking out the game, and I said to you, you know, I think uh, the Nets might actually be one of the better matchups for the Wizards, even though you've got like the last team in the league against one of the top teams in the league, but just let uh, Westbrook and Beal go to work offensively and just a no holds barred kind of match. And it sounds like the Wizards came out on top in the end of that. The final score of this game, wait, let me check if this is right. In a regular NBA game was 149 to 146 in four yeah. quarters, not overtime. I think I just heard the Atlanta Hawks criticize the Washington Wizards defense. That's like, unbelievable. That's just, the scoring is ridiculous. It's both these teams were like, I, no defense, it's just shoot around. And I'm going to make one more shot than you. <laughs> gentlemen's agreement crazy. no defense played speaking oh. of crazy ending the games with uh back-to-back threes in the last 10 seconds that wasn't the only one this weekend eh? no sir logo lillard pulls an absolute deep three to put the blazers within two they get the steal on the inbound uh or i think it's a deflection no. it goes out of bounds no it's no their they possession. are they got a double team on Levine, jump ball, yep. and uh, yep. won the jump ball. Yes, and then he comes down and hits it over basically two defenders, right? Off the uh, Trent Jr. went up for the jump ball, tucked it. Lillard just ran in, took it kind of running along the arc, and it was uh, Markinen guarding him, who must have like six inches in height and probably another couple in reach. But like, Lillard jump like it was a diagonal jump not a straight up jump and he still his form looked so flawless on the fadeaway it looked like a high percentage shot he just looked so comfortable taking it um I loved his post Aldridge. I loved his Paul George would say it's a bad shot. sorry Paul George. Paul George would say it's a bad shot <laughs> yeah I Lillard loved uh, Lillard's post-game interview on this one because he was saying I, I'm always so competitive and that like anytime we are losing in a game, I'm always imagining, okay, how can we still turn this around? And most of the time, my coach just takes me out when we're down by like seven, eight points with 15 seconds left. But this time it was close enough that he let me play. And I knew as soon as that as soon as we got the jump ball force, that if the ball was in my hands, I was going to make it. And that relates back to uh, just the feeling you had when you saw him fade back over Markinen. Like, yeah, I know this guy has about a foot in height and reach combined over him. I know he's however many feet out from the net, but when you saw him jump back and take that shot, it was, I mean, just all the appreciation in the world for Damian Lillard. And this, you add also, I think, to, on an injured team. Yeah. Add another to the collection, right? The dude is different. He's just got that clutch gene, and he's done it so many times. And obviously, I butchered recalling the sequence. Thank you for cleaning that up for me. But this guy <laughs> at bubble MVP and got a lot of recognition uh, throughout that bubble run for the Blazers. Uh, he needs to have another run like that right now because they're missing their number two and their number three guys in McCullum and Nurkic. Uh, and this Blazers team made some additions in the offseason that had them excited to make a run. Uh, and they're going to need their guys back. But until then, Dame's got to keep them afloat with performances like this. Like he's just, he's super special when he, when he's in that clutch moment because he is supremely confident and is able to just make ridiculous range threes and so pleasure to watch for him and and the Blazers are are holding on to one of those playoff seeds it's so tight there in the west believe conceive achieve something like that <laughs> another result we had tonight uh while we were recording the pod is uh our Toronto Raptors pulling out a win ending their three game losing streak uh this time they were without both OG and OB and Norman Powell for the game and got great contributions by Yuta Watanabe, Terrence Davis. Uh, Yuta blocked Yuka, Vucevic on a dunk attempt. I was super rattled by that. Davis had a couple steals and, and great backdoor cuts. And uh, the story of this game was Pascal Siakam. He was going at everyone. 
Uh, he had a great poster over Gordon. It, I don't remember the last time I saw Pascal poster someone. It's just not very common. Uh, but he definitely has the athletic tools to do it. And he was working well in the post. He was just getting to his spots and being aggressive. A lot of layups for him in this game. He had a couple missed ones that he should have made. He could have had more. He had 30 tonight. Uh, but a really solid effort. And Gordon goes out. He stepped on Stanley Johnson's ankle as he was crossing half court and tweaked it. And, and once Gordon left the game, you knew it was kind of over. Just the magic couldn't generate any offense. Uh, but a much needed win for the Raps to get them back on the right track. I, they're now eight and 12 and just a couple games back of that, that 10th seed. Yeah. I mean, they're going to keep battling. And like we said, last podcast, I, I have a hunch they'll sit somewhere in that like six to 10 range when the season's all done. But I, I mean, that's, it is great to have a culture built where a guy like you to can step up and, contribute and add what the team needs to win when they're lacking other mainstay pieces yeah also got a shout out deandre bempry he came in and had some good minutes as well uh next one really quick just want to touch on the utah jazz they made it up to 11 games uh with another win without mitchell but they get their streak snapped today by a marvelous performance by nikola Jokic, uh and the nuggets just made it look easy today with their win against them. It's going to happen. Uh, 11 in a row, though, they put themselves at the top of the Western Conference briefly. So just uh, just wanted to reference that game in terms of storylines. Uh, but I do want to move on to another Western Conference team, one who we both had very highly in our projections and instantly fell off the table. But since then, the Houston Rockets – after the James Harden trade, have had the second best defensive rating in the entire NBA. And their team finally has all the pieces together with John Wall, uh, Victor Oladipo. Not the best defenders, but guys who can stay in front of their man, who are quick quick feet and, and active hands and are vets who have done it now for a while. They've got rookie Jay Sean Tate, who kind of came out of nowhere and has been uh, – fabulous player for them uh, in the role that he's been able to play. And then you've got PJ Tucker, who's always going to be a solid stud on the defensive side. That's where he thrives. It's what he loves to do. And then you've got Christian Wood who is playing like an all-star and many will say that's coming from his insane usage rate, which I agree with, uh, but he's been fantastic on both sides of the floor for this team. And, uh, while the James Harden saga was going on and while Wall has been out with injuries and, and Victor Oladipo now just starting to get into the fold, he's been very consistent for them and playing really well. And people saw his potential back when he was in Detroit. Um, he bounced around the G League. He bounced around overseas for a while. And now he's finally found a home and he is just playing incredibly. And it's really, really awesome story to see him. Uh, and you've got a bunch of guys on this Houston team with something to prove. A lot of guys who have been given up on by other teams and they're hungry and they're playing great defense. And this team could actually be one that's fun to watch. So Houston Rockets fans, I know you've lost the generational talent in James Harden, but hang in there because this team can be fun. Uh, and if, and if they're that hardworking team, that's what fans seem to rally around. Uh, so good for the Rockets. They're going to hang in that playoff push. I wouldn't be surprised if they moved up a little bit because wall, uh, Wall, Depot, and Wood is a solid core uh, to make a little push for the back end of that playoff seating. So it should be fun to watch their progress. Yeah, I mean, like we just said, all about that culture. And you've got to feel like some sort of dark cloud has lifted over Houston with the end of that saga. And looking, I mean, I hadn't been tracking the Rockets too much but interesting to hear and i'll keep a tighter eye on that from now on absolutely the last game i wanted to talk about was last night's fantastic matchup between two historic rivals the los angeles lakers and the boston celtics uh the lakers pull out the win on a crazy end of game sequence uh where you had the <laughs> The Celtics, uh, Kemba Walker strips Anthony Davis on a fadeaway attempt, then kicks an outlet pass to Jalen Brown, which almost gets stolen by Alex Caruso. Brown recovers it. They swing the ball around. 
Kemba drives in, takes a step back jumper that misses. Tice gets a putback attempt, but he misses the putback attempt, and the Lakers hang on. Uh, it was excellent. Jalen Brown was great and has continued to be great and was going right at Anthony Davis. Uh, LeBron continues to have a stellar start to the season as he does basically a Terminator. Uh, so fun to watch him. And I think the biggest story coming out of this game for the Celtics is Marcus Smart injuring his calf uh, on a rebound battle against Montrezl Harrell. He'll be out for two to three weeks. And so the Boston Celtics team last year that that was that had some sort of depth with Hayward and Smart as guys that were interchangeable between Kemba and those two forwards, they now lose Smart, and he's a really big part of what that team does defensively. Uh, and they, if if Kemba needs to rest a game or if Kemba's overworked, they don't have a lot of depth behind him at the guard position. And so this will be a big loss for them for a couple of weeks. And they had Tatum out for two weeks, which they struggled because he's their best player. Um, and now missing Marcus Smart, the, it's just a bad timing for the Celtics, but they continue to play well through it all uh, and, and stay near the top of the Eastern Conference. Yeah, not to mention they didn't have Kemba for the start of the season. I think uh, their projected starting lineup of Kemba, Smart, Brown, Tatum, and Thais has started all of two games so far this season. So tough. I mean, we kind of knew going into this season that it, the teams that weathered COVID would be best off. And of all the Celtic hits, um, only one, the one to Tatum has been COVID related, but you mix injuries and COVID and it's just such a brutal uh, double bashing, but that is the making of a, strong franchise that they're still placed where they are and you've got to think however they end up in the playoffs there's going to be so much uh adversity and like strength riding on what they've had to push through so far and will continue to push through with the smart injury absolutely so that wraps up the nba storylines for this one we'll take one last break and come back to finish up with some hockey talk and we're back for some talking hockey. Uh, we're going to start with the Leafs. As always, uh, they played Saturday night, hockey night in Canada. Always love to see it. They don't play until Thursday, so they get a rest now. They had been the team that had played, I think, the second most games in the division behind Vancouver, um, but played a lot of games in a couple of nights and, and now get a nice break. Uh, I believe as they head back home, it should be, because it's been a long road trip. Uh, but Hey, seven, two, and one to start the season is not too shabby. They sit atop of the division. Uh, and we're going to break down a little what happened in that Leafs Oilers game on Saturday night. Max, take it away. Yeah. I mean, like you said, the Alberta road trip ending pretty well with, I mean, in their last four games, seven of eight possible points. But Saturday night, against the best hockey player in the world there's only so much you can do and Connor McDavid was the story of Saturday night I mean that goal might end up being the goal of the year I I don't I, I don't know when I knew he was gonna score but my perspective of that goal was he got the puck he started skating through and right around the a second before he blew by Muzzin I started saying Jesus fucking Christ and as I said Christ the puck went in the net but you just knew before before he even took the shot that he was going to score um as scary as that goal was the assist he had in the first was even scarier for me his feet basically on the red line behind the net on one side and then he managed to pass it to the other side I mean what do you do if you're any goalie but Frederick Anderson Connor McDavid standing five feet away from you you gotta hug your goal post but then he somehow like sets up his player for an open look like on the goal line I mean that that was tough credit to the Leafs for battling back so, yeah. <laughs> um, but every, every time he touches the puck 
it's a highlight reel worthy, right? He's got another four points tonight against Ottawa right now as we speak. And I think three of those coming on the power play. Like the kid is just sick. I apologize. Keep going. No, no. It's, uh, I mean, credit to the Leafs for battling back. I, it was a great effort, especially that, that Marner to Matthews give and go was beautiful. And that one-timer or shot by Matthews, like on the goal line, I, any other game almost, that is probably the highlight of the game. But McDavid, I mean, you just, the Oilers were on a three-game losing streak or something around there. They'd fallen short of where they wanted to be and they didn't want to make it for the as soon as the three on three overtime started I was kind of resigned to the loss the way McDavid was playing it was just a feeling that the second the puck that gets on this guy's stick I mean if he's winning puck battles one on four then like how is he not gonna put it away three on three and Nylander had a chance but couldn't quite do it and that was all she wrote. I, Like I said, when the best player in the world wants it that badly, there's only so much you can do. And that was the story of this game. And so far, the Oilers are kind of exactly on track for my prediction, at least, where Mc, on the backs of McDavid and Dreisaitl, they're doing enough. They're hanging in there, but it's not enough 56 games of the season. Yeah, and I was just happy to get to overtime because Freddie had to make a, a highlight of the week style save to get us there. Yeah. One timer, wide open cage, sprawls across. Fantastic. Um, if you're Mitch I, Marner, I, you're I, feeling a little rough. I don't know if you saw that one. He had a chance <laughs> to put it away late in the third, but just couldn't quite get the elevation. But. My, my qualm with overtime was, why is Tavares and Nylander going out to start against the McDavid? I'd rather have Matthews and Marner out there. It's, I think just Matthews matches up better with McDavid in I, terms of open ice speed. I, I don't think anyone matches up with McDavid in open ice speed. I don't. I think he scores whoever you put out there against him. I, I don't really mind. You had your bet one way or the other like okay you're gonna load your top line uh mcdavid dry sidle we'll put some guys out there and then when you have to take those two off we'll still have like i guess i'm trying to think of a gun analogy like you've got a double barreled shotgun we've got like a pistol with a full mag you've got to stop and reload we're good to keep firing but close cl- close range the double barrel shotgun is going to win i i don't know i just i i had no optimism or no faith really going into that ot the way mcdavid was playing yeah but we're happy to take a point and move along especially with the other result of the saturday night uh the montreal canadians get their first regulation loss of the season against the Calgary Flames. Always love it when the Montreal Canadiens lose. Uh, so it made the night a little bit better. Uh, and that was off the back of a stellar Jakob Markstrom performance. 37 saves on 37 shots. The shutout, the Flames take the 2-0 win. Uh, great performance by him. And yeah, keep the flame, keep the uh, Habs off our tail. That, that's always yeah. a good thing. To <laughs> I mean, Markstrom early, early into the season, looking like a great Vesna candidate. That's his second shutout of the season, putting up pretty solid numbers in the save percentage department and goals against. I think four is the most he's allowed so far. And I there was one stretch I remember hearing a stat when the Leafs were playing him that like four of the last five goals against him had come bouncing off a skate, whether that was friend or foe skate. Uh, and talk a lot about that players only meeting Calgary had after their loss prior to this game but I mean you brought this up in our last podcast the the struggle of the Flames right now is an offensive one they are not really getting enough goals and this win was off the back off a stellar performance of Markstrom they had one goal in five on five hockey with the second being an empty netter. So 
the Calgary woes are not over. Uh, what you like about them, though, is that now in every series, multi-game series they've had, except for against the Leafs, they've uh, managed to battle back and win and avenge a loss. And they've, I think they've got two or three against the Jets coming up, who are, I don't have a lot to say about the Canucks-Jets game, but we'll get to that in a sec. But the Jets coming off a loss, they now, ne- no longer have their most offensively gifted player so if you're a strong defensive team you've got to like that and and i think every team right now in the league or in the north division has played every team minus one and for the calgary flames the team they haven't played yet is the ottawa senators so hope on the horizon for calgary with a win a regulation win over the till then regulation undefeated montreal canadians markstrom looking great you've got to hope the players are going to start clicking a little more getting a little more offense uh, chance to continue what they've been doing and avenging their losses against the jets and then i don't know when they get that like two three game matchup against the senators but you do what you've continued to do and avenge your losses against the Jets. You get that Senators matchup and the fl- hey, like a week, two weeks from now, we might be looking at the Flames at the top of the division. All right. We'll wrap up our uh, Hockey Night in Canada kind of rundown with the uh, nightcap. The Vancouver Canucks defeating the Winnipeg Jets, the aforementioned Jets, by a score of 4-1. to one. And uh, it was a bit of an offensive onslaught for the Canucks. Max, take it away. Yeah, uh, Brock Bezer now leading the NHL in goals with eight, with one empty netter and one regulation. Uh, Fun bit of trivia, this was the first Vancouver Canucks regulation win in Winnipeg since the 90s, I believe. So nice to get that cherry popped through them and this is this is what i was talking about about the uh momentum matchups they're they're coming off the back of a tough start to the season but then they get the sends back to back or maybe it was even three because i think they're on a four game winning streak now but you you get to test out your system and let it flow a little get the offensive juices running and then you managed to score three goals against Connor Hellebuck, which is no easy task. You've got to be happy with uh, Brock Bezer stepping up and taking the lead in goals with Pedersen starting the season a little colder than expected. I He did have a great one-time opportunity that off of a Hughes pass that Hellebuck absolutely stonewalled on. But yeah, I mean, probably I don't feel quite as strongly a, on the optimism case for the Canucks as I do for the Flames as their hitherto undone matchup is against our Leafs who are looking red hot and I'm obviously going to put my money on the Leafs to drill through the Canucks but momentum flowing for the Canucks nice to get that win in Winnipeg long time coming and it was a great hockey night in Canada with the six top teams matching up against each other. Definitely. Maybe we can step back a little and talk about the division as a whole. Absolutely. And the thing that I wanted to talk about the division is when I was watching that Leafs Oilers game, I'm used to in the past going, it's all right if this game goes to overtime because they're East team and a West team and they're both going to get a point and shake hands and whoever wins the game, that's fine. But the point is really important uh, for both teams in their respective conferences uh, making a run. But now I got to rewire my brain because in that game, I was thinking it's okay if we go to overtime, but it's not because in this division, you only play teams within your division. It's not, you're not playing outer division uh, games where the points are, less important and teams are will play for overtime. You can't do that in this division because every game you play matters and every game you play could be a four point swing one way or the other. Because if you're not winning, the other team is winning and they're stealing points that you need and moving up in the division standings. And so that is another layer of, of just emotion of importance that get added onto these Canadian games because each one of these matters. If you're not getting points, 
your uh, your competitor is and they're not in another division moving up they're in your division moving up and so it's fantastic to watch these games so far and the implications have been great and at, at this rate i don't see why we wouldn't just keep the canadian division in the future and obviously you'd have your out of division games but why not keep them all together because it's been excellent so far truly excellent so much fun yeah and i think teams traditionally especially in those east west matchups have known that and been willing to take the foot off the gas a little in the last couple minutes of the third period like okay we'll each give each other a point and then duke it out and triple ot in ot but uh you watching the leaf soilers game you didn't see that i mean i mentioned that marner chance then the leafs would in the last minute of the third were looking to generate something offensively and the pressure caused them to i think it was muzzin who stumbled and then the oilers almost put it away so you're seeing teams put their foot on the gas a little harder i think in the at the end of the third than they typically would and the last thing i sort of hinted at this talking about the flames but there's been a lot of parody in that top six so far other than the leafs flames matchup i think there haven't really been any series that have happened over two games none over three games where uh, one team has run away with all three wins in the top six that is we're not including the sends um it does hurt a little that their only win has come over the leafs but, but yeah it's so i mean that's what you love about hockey and that you don't know if the goalie is going to stand on his head. You don't know how the puck's going to bounce. You don't know if the star player is going to be able to put it on their stick the right way. And you see so much parity in the game. And you're seeing that really play out in the division with the teams having to work so hard every night. And you have no idea what's going to happen and who's going to come away with it, except that Ottawa is not going to come away with it. And I'm loving this Canadian division. I, I'm not very optimistic about hanging on to it, but man i mean i i'm so excited for the next time the leafs play the flames like how are we going to try and get under to chuck's skin next time and uh, yeah i'm i'm loving this matchup when next time the leafs and the habs go together they kicked off the season against each other and right now they're the top two teams in the division so you know that's going to be just a little extra fuel on the fire and like i said that the start of this podcast there are some silver linings in the sporting world with covid and this canadian division might be the biggest one absolutely man it's only going to get better from here in the nhl and the nba the games are only going to get more important as we move along uh we've got one week left of football uh looking forward to the super bowl and i think that's where we're going to leave it here want to thank everyone so much for listening uh leave a like and a review uh, if you're on youtube and and leave a review on wherever you listen to our podcast we're available on every platform it would mean a lot to us and we appreciate all the listeners out there hoping you're staying happy staying safe staying healthy uh and thank you once again for li- for listening sports next door signing off <laughs>